Hello, my name is Jack Harvey Clark from Apex Acoustics. We're a firm of acoustic consultants. And we often get involved in the design of open plan offices. We were fortunate enough to be involved in this particular case study. So I hope you enjoy what I think it shows about the importance of control in the acoustic design. This was a workplace transformation program in a very large organisation. In fact, in a very small part of a very large organisation. So there are over 10,000 people working on floor plates that look very much like this. There's 130 people on this particular one with desks arranged traditionally in rows perpendicular to the windows on the left. and On the right hand side, there's an atrium in the centre of the building. So one of these floor plates was used to try out new ways of working. It was design led, uh, <clears throat> but they avoided using labels like activity based working or hot desking or anything like that, and just provided a range of settings for people. They provided them with laptop computers and let them find the most appropriate place to do their work. During this process, they had many staff surveys on both the new and traditional floor plates. One of those questions concerned the working environment. So they asked people to rate their level of agreement with the following statements. I'm satisfied with the lighting, the acoustics, the climate in the office. So we can look at the results from these surveys. So the blue column is on the traditional floor plate. The orange column is soon after they'd moved in, in 2016. And the gray column is when they'd settled in after three months. So you can see an increase in the satisfaction with the lighting, with the thermal comfort, and also with the acoustics. And we can compare these results against the Leesman global scores. So this is the world's biggest uh, staff workplace satisfaction survey. Uh, and you can see the lighting and the thermal comfort almost exactly match the global averages uh, on the traditional floor plate. Um, whereas the acoustics, people were already satisfied with the acoustics compared to the average and they became even more satisfied. We can also look at the Leesman Plus, which is those high performing workplaces where still on average, they don't get anywhere near the level of satisfaction that they found in this place. So how could they explain this satisfaction with the acoustics? So our job was to benchmark the acoustics, as they called it uh, here, so that they could put that as part of their brand standards and replicate it in other places. What were the acoustic conditions that they needed to achieve to get this level of satisfaction? So to this end, we devised a um, some measurements of both the unoccupied room, the room acoustic response, the left hand column where we took the parameters, some of the parameters from ISO 3382 part three. And we also had the opportunity to take measurements of the in situ acoustic environment. So how was it for actually four people while the offices were being used? So looking at the unoccupied measurements, then the measurements of the empty room, we took a couple of measurement paths on the traditional floor plate and on the new floor plate we took three measurement paths but actually um, if I can show here so the measurement paths we took tended to avoid the uh, the pods to so the big obstructions on the new floor plate so if you like we've taken the worst performing uh, paths on the new floor plate and this one here goes very close to this pod. So if we look at those results this is <clears throat> what we see so this result is the one that goes very close to the pod uh, but all the other lines of spatial decay are indistinguishable. Similarly for the speech level at four meters there's not really a significant difference between these two floor plates. Looking at the occupied measurements, 
Uh, we measured uh, for three hours in a st one static position. Um, that's this one. And then the other positions were measurements of 15 minutes each. These are the positions on the traditional floor plate. And here they are on the new floor plate. So looking at the results then, the three hour average, 53 dB, uh, which is fairly typical for open plan offices with a range of 50 to 56 at each of the roving positions. On the new floor plate, very similar, 54 on average and a range of 48 to 56 at the roving positions. So we can't really measure any difference with the ambient noise level. We also used those measurements to look at liveliness. And uh, this is, has been designed as a um, an indicator for uh, to characterise the acoustic environment in activity based working offices. If we look at the uh, fixed positions where we had a three hour measurement on the traditional office in yellow there, we can see a fairly wide range of values from four to eight point five, but centred on a value of five, whereas in the new office, the values are closer together. So that suggests a more consistent range of activities on the new floor plate and a wider range of activities over time at one place on the old floor plate. If we look at the spatial variation um, on the traditional floor plate, the pattern is fairly similar. Whereas on the new floor plate, we've got a different pattern which is a broader range of values. The values are more broadly spread. So this suggests that there's a greater spatial variation of activities on the new floor plate. But this is very soft information. Let's just remind ourselves that the increase in satisfaction that we've seen in the acoustic condition. So we can't measure any difference between the room acoustics nor with the acoustic environment in situ between these two offices. What's really changed, of course, is the level of control that people have over their work. They can choose where they sit and where they do what they want. Should we have known this? If we go back and look at the ISO 3382 part, it, part 3 indicators, <clears throat> And the review of those. So the authors showed that uh, radius of distraction is best correlated with uh, percentage of people who are highly disturbed by noise. But they also picked out these four offices where there were either activity based working or where there was a protected quiet space. So where people had a greater sense of control and suggested that these might not follow the same pattern as the others. If we look outside the acoustics literature for information on control, we can see in the psychological literature that control is considered essential for an individual's well-being. Psychological and biological necessities, these are fairly strong, uh, fairly strong terms. And if we look at the literature around productivity in buildings, and the control is described as a killer variable for comfort and productivity. So it's absolutely central. Uh, it's just not very well documented in the acoustics literature. What does this mean then about how we should be thinking about designing for acoustic satisfaction? Well, some people have taken, proposed a, what they call a psychoacoustic approach here to resolving office noise distraction. Um, and other authors have taken a soundscape approach and found that the most important factors for acoustic satisfaction are the acoustical space planning and a sense of control. So if we're designing for acoustic satisfaction, then we should be thinking about all these things, the people, the level of control they have of the culture, how that space is managed, so the sociological or psychoacoustic approach, as well as the acoustic space planning as, and the room acoustics. We need to do all these things together. So perhaps the most important thing is the questions that we ask. Thank you very much, and I'd be very glad to answer any questions.